you've reached the Signal Watch. Movies, television, comics, and more. I'm your host, Ryan Steens. Join me and our cadre of co-contributors as we examine cultural artifacts of the 20th century, boldly explore the 21st, and try to put it all in perspective. Stay tuned. We're going to try to make this work. everybody and welcome back to the signal watch as always i'm your host ryan steens and with me today is simon day lovely to be back with you again and we are up bright and early today because the last time we tried to do this we had some network issues and so we're we're back for round two uh and what are we talking about today we're well uh, like the character himself that probably gets up in the middle of the night and annoys other people <laughs> we're um we're up very early on a saturday morning to do drop dead fred from 1991, uh, starring Rick Mill, Phoebe Cates, Carrie Fisher, and Marsha Mason, among others. Uh, yeah. Um, so uh, you said over a text or whatever, like, let's do Drop Dead Fred. And I immediately responded with yes. And part of it was I just hadn't seen this movie since I was like 15 or 16. I guess 16, because I would have been 16 in 91. Well, it's interesting because I have seen it pretty recently. Um, there was a big gap, I guess, through the 90s, early 2000s when I hadn't. But I think I bought it about 10 years ago, and I, I watched it definitely in the last couple of years. Um, so it'd be interesting because it kind of still works for me. I'll, I'll lay my cards on the table early. It still works for me. I can definitely see why it doesn't work for some people, though, because <laughs> you either... Rick Mel's like Marmite. You either love it or hate him, I think. Um, but but it's interesting. I'll be interested in your point of view, having not seen it for a long time. Because um, I feel like when this came out, it totally flopped um, in the UK and the US. But like our, our age, our generation, people in their late 40s, mid to late 40s, we all seem to have seen this film and have a fondness for it. I mean, and that was kind of how I remembered it was like, oh, yeah, I saw this in the theater and, and you know, it was it was a good time. And then but I hadn't really thought about it much, you know, since then yeah. um, it comes up every once in a while getting a reference here or there. Uh, but, yeah, I I, I, yeah, I think it had a good run on U.S. cable here. So that's probably why people saw it. Um, yeah. But uh, it just wasn't really a renter for me or, or anything like that. So. Well, it's a weird old film anyway, isn't it? It's a weird old film because it doesn't seem to know whether it wants to be a kid's film or an adult darker comedy. And at least in England, probably here as well, the, the certificate was kind of too high for kids to see. It was like a 15. Because um, it has got swearing in and it's got sexual references and some pretty dark stuff. Um, but it's almost like pretending to be a Tim Burton film from the time. Yeah, it's funny. I mentioned to Stuart yesterday that we were recording this and he said, yeah, it always struck me as like someone was trying to make a, a Pee Wee Herman movie or something. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, you, you two have aligned on this one. Um, so well, it's like it's like they kind of like took some of the ingredients, but like missed one. It's kind of it's kind of it's like Jeff Goldblum going to his uh, teleporter. You know, he, he didn't see the fly. So and something. Something horrible came out the other end. Although I actually really like it. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you kind of hit the, the nail on the head of of what I think that there's... I think the movie has two large problems. I didn't love it watching it this time. Um, mm. And I think one of the problems is what you just described of it's it is framed and shaped like a kid's movie, but not in a way that... that 
<laughs> the tools of that as an adult movie particularly well like it, it just doesn't it it just doesn't quite click being one or the other um it's good so isn't it it's good so yeah and, and you know i i i know what you mean about i i'm sorry it's a, oh, rick mile mail oh rick mail yeah yeah so everybody here who would know him knew him from the young ones he was he was yeah we hear the most here neil were the most popular characters uh if you were someone who watched the young ones that was being shown on MTV back in the day. So well, my I, ex was a my ex was a huge young ones fan, and I think probably like you, she stayed up and watched it kind of midnight on the weekend or something when it was shown. Yeah, it was. It was. Uh, I believe they showed it on like Saturday nights because um, I remember very much being in middle school and and watching Young Ones uh, like two or three episodes at a shot and and being very familiar with who the characters were and. Um, and I went to go see the movie less for Phoebe Cates and more for him because he yeah. I was like, oh, my God, he's coming to the U.S. Like, that's crazy. So, well, it was that that kind of thing where an English comedian kind of has a big break. They kind of go for Hollywood, their Hollywood break, um, which, you know, I suppose I suppose there's huge successes like Peter Sellers or Dudley Moore. And then there's like all the, all the drop dead threads. But like, you know, if an English comedian is kind of hot, They'll, they'll have one go at Hollywood and probably fail and never go back. Yeah, there were lots of different kinds of folks you could see kind of trying to dip their toe in the water. And it wasn't just English. It was also Australian. Like at the same time, we're getting like the Yahoo serious movie, like Young yeah. Einstein and things like that of like, this guy does Jamie's, a stick. Jamie's a huge fan, I know. <laughs> we have posters <laughs> up all over the house. Um but yeah, I mean, I, I I actually don't blame him at all for this. I think the director completely failed everybody. Um, I, but I also think it starts at the script stage with this movie. Well, Rick Mail's pretty much just doing exactly what he always does, <laughs> which is, um, you know, he had a really good 80s and, and probably like most of the 90s in England where he just kind of got bigger and bigger. And like you say, he kind of started off in The Young Ones. And then he did like, you know, like later on, he did kind of, he did like cameos in Blackadder. There was, uh, there were hilarious, you know, there's the famous line where he's like the kind of the flying ace that rescues Blackadder. And he's like, I treat my, treat my woman like my plane. I get in there three times a day and take her to heaven and back. Woof. And he's like all those kind of lines. Um, and then Bottom, you know, a lot, of, a lot of this stuff with Adrian Edmondson where they're basically just punching each other and a lot of very visual slapstick. Um, he also did the New Statesman for another channel for the ITV channel where he played a corrupt conservative MP, and that was very popular. So he was really hot when he made this. He was very big, and he's he's pretty much just doing exactly what they asked him to. I would think. Yeah, and that's why I kind of blame the director and and maybe the editor a bit. If he's doing this kind of hyperkinetic manic character, but the camera just kind of sits there and like seems to watch him across the room of like, well, we're only, we only have enough time to like get a take of this or something. We can't get possibly get coverage of what's happening. And part of me kind of liked that though. Cause I felt like, and it probably wasn't like you say, it probably wasn't a conscious decision, but it's almost like, cause Phoebe Cates is the only one who can see him. Mm hmm. You know, she's obviously like trying to act normal and he's just kind of smashing stuff up in the background. So it's not like, you know, it's not like from his point of view, it's more like, you know, he's just doing something annoying in the background. Yeah. I mean, there's definitely some of that. I was thinking about in particular, like when he first comes down to breakfast with her and, and Marsha <laughs> Mason, like wandering around and they do some, and I started wondering like, what well, was the day taken up by the fact that they knew they had to put this makeup on him at some point? Yeah, that's true. So they yeah. just didn't have enough time to get the rest of what they needed for coverage or something. Like I shouldn't be thinking about that during a movie. And I no. won't. um I, I'm I sure they can't. quick because it's possible people don't know what the plot is of this and it's super simple, but so I'll run <laughs> Phoebe Cates plays about a 27, 28 year old woman who is about to get divorced from Tim Matheson, her her husband, who is a Eating. A cheating husband. Yes, yeah. 
Um, he he's a he's a car dealer. Um, a second hand car dealer, which is well, actually a brand new car dealer. But that, I guess just being a car dealer, yeah, is a, a big warning sign. Yeah, there, that was definitely something coded in there. Um, and he, uh, anyway, so she decides she doesn't want to get divorced, but he's like, no, no, I'm going to run off with, it turns out Bridget Fonda. So good on him. Um, and Uh, he, uh, anyway, she goes home to be with her mother one way or another, which is not something she particularly wants to do. And her mother's very overbearing. And while she's at home, her imaginary friend from her childhood, uh, drop dead Fred, who is Rick Mile. Uh, pops out of a jack in the box, and then you get the long history of like not who he is, but kind of what they're what she was like when he was yeah. running around. There's a suitor who was the kid who lived down the street who loved how chaotic she was when Rick was oh, sorry when Rick when Drop Dead Fred was part of her life, and um, anyway, Drop Dead Fred starts causing chaos in her life, uh, and she through this chaos learns like she's okay being on her own blah 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 so that's kind of the plot of drop dead friend i mean her mom i mean i think you know in a way and i'm jumping the gun a bit here but in a way you know this is a film kind of ahead of its time because it is really about repression and childhood trauma and mental illness and apparently they've used it on some patients who do have imaginary friends or have dissociated identities and it's actually worked very well as kind of like, you know, as a kind of like a tool or, you know, a learning tool or a kind of visual aid type thing. And I can, I can see that the, I think in this gets kind of gets to what I think my second problem with the movie is, is I think it's, there are a few scenarios of what is really happening in the film and the film doesn't ah, care to I'm answer so, that. I'm totally with you. Cause I'm, I, I put a big question mark over, what exactly can Fred do? Because <laughs> sometimes he seems like he's just there and literally he can't do anything that she wouldn't do. But then he seems to be totally, other times, totally autonomous and off like, you know, like, you know, when they're on the boat, when she kind of takes the boat, which is kind of a bit stupid anyway, where she thinks she sees uh, Tim Matheson in a speedboat. Uh-huh. So she starts chasing him in this, like, you know, this steamer. Carrie Fisher is like, you know, paddle steamer well fred's like trying to help but he's smashing up all the engine i'm like well did phoebe cates do that because otherwise it wouldn't be damaged would it so that was actually the scene that made me have this thought (laughs) (laughs) there you go great minds yeah Uh, well i mean i don't think it's a mistake because it, it the the question is okay so if fred is real and he's he's a real magical imaginary thing that's running around because he's either like a ghost that can kind of like like a poltergeist that can do things Mm -hmm. or she's doing it herself right Right. and if if he's if he is imaginary or i mean real then he's actually the source of the friction between she and her mother (laughs) that's the previous saying fred is here to save her from but fred is the one who is constantly causing it as you see in the flashbacks when she's a child well well doing because fred is telling her to do it well i would say though her mother is horrible anyway and very um incredibly controlling so i think it's possibly her repressed it's funny because i actually wrote down forbidden planner because i said fred's basically the creature from the id yeah i think you're right (laughs) so it's her it's it's the daughter playing up it's phoebe kate's playing out or kicking out um at her mother trying to control her so much right and and so then there's definitely the is he a manifestation of of her id like you said uh i i definitely kind of thought of it like in, on the scale of is fred real or not yeah if he's not real then she is a person having absolutely psychotic episodes Oh, yeah. And they do get a nurse, don't they? And keep her uh, kind yeah. of like, I mean, they don't quite restrain her, but they keep her in the uh, in the house under lock and key. Yeah. And in that case, if she's really doing things like hurling dinner plates across restaurants, she needs to get some help. The <laughs> mother is, in that case, not entirely wrong. 
And so the movie has this like really crazy relationship with its own reality of like wanting to have its cake of like the mother is, is this person she needs to free herself from. But Fred, meanwhile, in his own way is, and this was kind of a popular character type in like the, the eighties and nineties of like the friend who was completely crazy and, oh, yeah. like, and, and the, the main character just kind of walks along beside them and it creates this this dynamic of like so the first thing she does take the dog poo in the living room <laughs> yeah. the, the first thing that happens when fred shows up is it's not an unreasonable request to w- shampoo your carpet like that's a thing people do in in their museum houses yeah and she in theory doesn't live there anymore it's not a huge thing for her mother to ask her not to be there so either fred is intentionally damaging the relationship between fragile relationship at that between she and her mother. Yeah. Or she is acting out psychotically and getting shit on her feet and storming around the living room. Those are the two things that could have potentially happened in that scenario. Yeah. Well, I think as we get older, unreasonable for not wanting shit in her living room. (laughs) I think as we get older, you and I are more concerned about the carpet than we were (laughs) when we were kids. Yeah, when I was 16, I was like, ha, 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 ha. Now we're like, I'd have to clean that up. Yeah, Uh, someone's got to clean that up. Yeah. I mean, you're right, because I can... And that's a pretty tough scene to start with, to be honest, because, you know, it's not like he starts off small and builds. And, And Marsha Mason is set up as, like, you know, at worst abusive and at best way to controlling a narcissistic um you know she does i think on some level care about phoebe cates but she's like you know it's almost like um affection is kind of like you know it's not it's not gi- i will only give you affection if you do exactly what i want yeah um, um so you know so there is there is that but at the same time yeah fred seems like you know it's quite a dispor- disproportionate kind of like uh kind of like retaliation really what he does i think a lot of the time yeah and i mean and it, you you see at the very end of the film when they're showing kind of the the scenario which led to her father leaving and and fred being locked away yeah like they're trying to do something like novelistic or something to like really draw all these threads together but it kind of also doesn't work because the scene starts with marcia mason cleaning up the, her, the child version of phoebe kate's from whatever yeah. it was that Fred had had her doing. And then when she leaves the room for five minutes, she comes back in and there's dirt and shit all over their dining room. Oh, with the mud pie and the cornflakes. Yeah. And cornflakes are like all over the living room, all over the dining room. And you're, yeah, kind of- I mean, you basically strangle the kid. Um, how yeah. cute she is. But I mean, it's, you know, and it's kind of like, oh, I, I did like the ending though. I did like the fact that, He's kind of, um, I mean, it seemed very rushed, though, like you said. Like, they, they almost had scenes missing where suddenly he goes, I guess, like, when he's dying because of the pills later that she's taking to phase him out, they suddenly go to, like, I guess his world or her subconscious, and then she has to face her fears and tick them off, you know, the boyfriend or the husband and the mother, and then... And then I guess like she doesn't need him anymore and she can stand on her own feet. So, but that seemed very rushed to me. Suddenly it was almost like they kind of ran out. They were like, Oh, how are we going to finish this? Yeah. I mean, I think it was really well intentioned and just that, that, that whole thing. I agree. I just, it, it felt very rushed and like they hadn't really built to it enough. They were having more fun, like, watching phoebe kate throw plates around restaurants and, uh, <laughs> i mean i will i will say this working with kids myself kids can be very very savage oh and yeah. i think i think adults tend to forget that um maybe not parents but any other adults tend to like you know go oh you know kids are cute and whatever and like funny and it's like they can be real shit to each other and occasionally to you if they get a chance um and that's why, you know, films like this and maybe maybe Where the Wild Things Are really kind of hit upon that, I think. The fact that, you know, 
they can be very animalistic and nasty when they want to be. Yeah, and I get that she's supposed to be kind of returning to that as she's like regressing um with the trauma of what's happening with with Tim Matheson. Um, yeah. But I just don't think they do a phenomenally good job of covering that. And the the kind of funny the funniest part of the movie to me oddly was Carrie Fisher. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, with a chair in the office? With, yeah, because Carrie Fisher is the person who kind of is like very like like late 80s pop psychology. Like, I've read this. I've read that. Like, I'm doing all the <laughs> self-help stuff. I mean, but, isn't that Carrie Fisher herself? She's kind of playing herself, nearly. You know? Yeah, absolutely. It, it felt very much like they just dropped Carrie Fisher, like, straight from her home in L.A. into this movie. Um, and it was... But it her willingness to be game and to go, okay, I know what's going on. I'm going to help. Yeah. That was funny where she's standing on the chair and Fred's just kind of watching her again. She's, she's nuts. Yeah. <laughs> it was a really good bit. <laughs> I think, I think that in the restaurant with the glass where, you know, Phoebe Cates is a much better physical comedian than you give her credit for. I mm. think those are my favorite bits. Cause like where, you know, he's messing around with a wine glass. Yeah, no, she she did an amazing job there. The only reason the scene feels crazy now watching it is the guy who I get arrested, <laughs> and the guy. Right, well, yeah, there's, there's, there's I love you. That. I love you. I'm going to throw my wine glass as well. Yeah, and I was just like, he like loves the fact that she's like having a psychotic episode across the table. <laughs> like, oh, you're so daffy, and I'm like, she's being dangerous. Yeah, he hasn't dated for a while. He may, yeah. maybe hasn't dated for years, so he's like, you know. And I'll take anything. But, but maybe that's what happens when you have Phoebe Kate sitting across the table. You're like, I will. I would put up with a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I'll probably put up with her <laughs> putting shit in my carpet. Um, <laughs> well, she also, you know, Phoebe Kate's obviously she's gorgeous, but she also kind of looks like a little girl, mm -hmm. which I think really helps because she's got, you know, the big eyes and stuff. Um, so I think that definitely help sell it compared to like some actresses who who have played this yeah i i mean i think the casting on this is uh, of many of the things that work in this movie like all of the casting is really good i i, I still i think rick mail was the right choice for what they wanted for fred yeah. well they were talking about robin williams and i just feel like if it had been robin williams they would have played it a lot safer um at least at this point in Robin Williams' career, maybe maybe later on when he kind of was doing death death to Smoochie and stuff, yeah. that it kind of got darker. But I think at this point they would have sanitized that bit because you know Rick Mail was shouting piss off and you know doing sex jokes and stuff. <laughs> you know, like, like this is this is kind of like pretty inappropriate, but then it's supposed to be because you know he's he's basically saying everything she's thinking, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I can, I definitely know what you mean. I mean, with this, that's also a movie with like eight times the budget of this movie. Yeah, yeah. Um, you might yeah. have still had Phoebe Cates, but that you you're you're sitting down with Robin Williams and his team, and you're rewriting this movie from scratch at that point. Yeah, is it going to appeal to the kids? And can we merchandise it and stuff? Yeah. Um, I mean, there's also horror elements though, because like when she kind of sneaks out um yeah to go and see carrie fisher he's kind of hanging upside down like a vampire in her living room yeah i hadn't really thought of it that way but uh yeah there's there's the question of if he's real what is he getting out of this relationship yeah and how and you know i mean that's the thing they never iron down or nail down why does he disappear sometimes you know what can he actually physically do um and it's funny like you know i was talking to somebody at work and about my film choices and she was like oh you're you're pretty sentimental and i'm like how dare you no i'm not i'm english <laughs> and and then i thought actually no i am you know i embrace my sentimentality and i feel like maybe this film works for me because you know it is pretty sentimental i mean her saying goodbye to him and and i really like the ending where she kind of can't see him anymore but she knows he's there because the um the other little kid's doing kind of like a pinky promise. Yeah, and I, I think that's why I find, part of why I find the movie so baffling, because I think that's the kind of stuff I remembered about it. 
Yeah. Of it has stuff that on paper, these are scenes from a movie that's better connected and, and is better written. Those scenes work. Yeah. I love the letter as well from the little girl where he's like, look, you wrote me this letter saying, you know, we'll be together forever. And it's just, you see the letter. <laughs> it's just like a mess. It's like gobbledygook and like backward letters and stuff. Yeah. He can, read, he can read it, though, you know. <laughs> it's like they started with the end and kind of had a concept for the beginning, and everything else in it just doesn't really hold. Um, no. Do you think I, Fred is a surrogate dad because he's English, like her dad? So obviously, the mum married an English guy, mm-hmm. and then she's got him under the thumb. But then there's lots of English stuff in the film, like teapots and stuff. So. He's permeated the American existence a bit. And then we never find, do we ever find out what happened to the dad? I guess he just left her. Well, and that doesn't really make sense either. Uh, Because why wouldn't he be coming back and saying, at least looking after Phoebe Cates or saying, are you okay? Right. Like I would, it would have made more sense if they would have then said and dot, dot, dot. And then your father passed. Well, yeah, I, I figured he'd either left and just gone back to England or he died. But then it's in, it is interesting how Fred is English. I, I completely agree. And I think the director or script or something was going with the movie, at least writ large, was trying to make some connection there. Yeah. And just like it didn't quite work. And so they just were like, well, just let let, let's just not spend time on that. Like, yeah. And that feels like most of the film, to be honest. Mm-hmm. It's almost like, you know, they give you like a taste and then they're like, but we're not really going to follow that up, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, the, the, and one of the, speaking of not following things up, one of the big things that like she sinks Carrie Fisher's home, which, which Carrie Fisher takes very well. Because <laughs> well, cause, well. cause you're, I love you. You're my friend. But I think if you blew up my house with all my stuff, in there, <laughs> I'd be a bit upset at least briefly. Oh, that, that's like, we're no longer speaking, right? I mean, like, you're, you're <laughs> done with somebody. They've destroyed your home doing God <laughs> knows what. And, I, mean, I mean, yeah, because it's not even an accident, really. She just kind of did it. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's, she is, it's the time when you're watching the film that, A, her motivation doesn't really make sense to go chase Tim Matheson. She's not going to catch a speedboat with this barge. Yeah. And they just do it to sink the boat. It's just to have the scene. It's a joke, isn't it? It's just a joke where he's being a pirate, Fred's being a pirate, and, you know, he's, like, hitting... <laughs> I do like how his way of helping is hitting uh, hitting all the engine dolls with a hammer. Yeah. I mean, and so you, you do, like... So maybe Fred... And this is when I started thinking, is Fred real? Is Fred not real? I was like, well... She can't be in both places. So maybe it's just that the boat was not really in condition to ever move. Like it needed to just, yeah. be, it's just there aesthetically, like a lot of houseboats. So we're seeing kind of one version, but really the engine's just breaking in reality. Yeah. And so I was like, well, if that's happening. Or Fred is down in the engine room with a hammer. Like one of the two things is happening. Well, uh, if, Fred, if Fred was kind of real, as in, he affected physical reality other people would surely see stuff more you know they'd see like say phoebe kate sitting at a table but in a bookshelf far away from her falling over i would think so then they'd go what the hell was that (laughs) yeah yeah now you officially have a haunting um yeah And the, it's not like there's any indication that the other children in the therapist's office see the other imaginary friends. I did like that. I liked how they only saw their own friend kind of playing with nothing. Mm-hmm. I thought that was quite clever, too. Yeah. And I like how, you know, they all were different, slightly different. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I, kind of, I thought that was quite cool how they, they were like, oh, I haven't seen you for ages. Oh, you know, I've been busy and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I, th- I I did like the fact that all these kids and you get to see their kind of, you know, whoever their 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 crazy um, imaginary friends are. But anyway, I you know the the everyone and that's kind of the thing that's weird about this movie. I went and looked to see what else this director had done. His name is like Eight Dijon. It's he. It's, yeah, isn't he like European? Uh... He's 
I want to say Dutch. Um, yeah. And he's done. He like did a kind of dark. Of- I read a kind of dark thing about him the other day where he said, oh, "I'd actually been abused as a kid, and I didn't tell anybody when we were making this, not even Rick Mel." But that obviously played a lot into how I felt making it. Interesting. Yeah. So I think he'd been abused by his stepbrother or something, and he was like, yeah, it was, you know, it was very kind of personal for me. Yeah, I mean, most of the stuff he's done looks like it's, like, fairly heavy drama. So... A weird choice, then, really. Yeah, he's a weird choice of a director. It sounds like he had a lot of his own baggage he brought to the film. (laughs) Kind of makes sense. Um... And I mean, it, I, I mean, it's kind of cool. Like I say, I think, I think maybe we were more forgiving because we were closer to childhood when we saw it. Um, oh, yeah, and we definitely, you know, I don't know more. Were we less cynical? Probably, right? So you know, so we kind of watched it, and we were like, I mean, for me, like you said, it was like, hey, it's my favorite comedian mm-hmm. in a in a Hollywood film. And it and you know he's pretty much being himself. They haven't changed him, and you know and it's all about basically just doing what you want and being kind of very punk and like expressing yourself. And obviously that's gonna that's gonna hit a lot harder in your twenties than your forties. Oh yeah, yeah. Because by your forties, by your forties, you'll be like, well, I might get arrested, or you know, <laughs> I might have to pay for the damage. Um. And, and, you know, the, the rebellion against, you know, every, you know, I was in high school. My mom's great. But at the time, she's the figure of authority in your life. You're like, yeah, tell off mom, you know. Yeah. Um, and that, that and, you know, I definitely realized, you know, as I was. Stick to the man. School of, yeah. And of like, oh, you know, there's people whose parents really are not great. Like, they really are kind of these, these, you know yeah pushy mom I mean, well yeah yeah and you you know we all had a friend at school who you know i mean you know probably had problems one way or another with a parent um yeah maybe maybe not too severely but maybe i mean maybe so but like you know at least on a on a kind of small level they were like yeah you know my mom and dad said i couldn't do this or whatever or i had to do this and you're like well sure you know yeah i mean i still remember being at college night at my high school and a dad standing up and being like well my son's going to major in business and da 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 and the you're like, you're the, like, no, the no. counselor up there is like is that what he wants to do and he said it's what he's going to do and you could hear, <laughs> like everyone including the other parents in the room just like, yeah. like oh that's what's going on at their house like yeah <laughs> Yeah, thanks, Dan. Well, the funny thing is, I saw that guy two years later, and he was actually in the Marines. Oh, there you go. There yeah, you go. He, he apparently like skipped out and been like, "No, yeah. <laughs> I don't want to be a business major." Well, that's the thing about life, isn't it? You know, you're you're constantly searching for what gives you, um, I guess, meaning, or what. I mean, it's it's that constant balance, isn't it, between making enough money to survive and doing something you enjoy um and you know and a lot of people kind of give up on well on one or the other really you know yeah yeah um, but you know but i mean that's that's the that's the thing but at least you know when i guess when when we were teenagers when this came out you know it seemed like you had endless options and it's only when you get older that you kind of see them slowly kind of like you know whispering away and your channel getting kind of narrow and narrow really Oh yeah, yeah, and especially at this point of of you know, I am I am much closer to worrying about retirement than I am about like what am I going to do next with my career. Yeah, um, yeah. But well, yeah. I mean, uh, so so, how do you feel like ultimately about it? Because you know, I know you said it didn't really live up to your memories. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, I think the movie has so many fundamental problems that it ends up fighting against itself and the good things it's trying to do. Uh, um, yeah. and it, it so I kind of, you know, I don't, I don't give it a very high grade, but, um, 
if you ask me about individual parts of it, like is Phoebe Cates good? Yes. Um, yeah. you no, know, is, is Marsha Mason being exactly what she needs to be? 100%. Like she, yeah. you, you do not like her by the end of the film, but I think the story fundamentally has some problems. And I think that they needed to do a better job of, and this is something that like love or hate Marvel, but they brought kind of the Star Trek nerd ethos to everything of yeah. like, you need to be able to explain this one way or another, because this will bother yeah. some people. Um, and it well, needed, I'd, I'd, I'd say until recently. <laughs> <laughs> I, feel, I feel like with the multiverse, it's just like, we can do whatever now. Every, everybody can die and come back. But, but yeah, but the multiverse is exactly, it's like we've given people a reason now to do the nonsense, right? Yeah, yeah. But, the, but, but you're right, actually. I mean, like, think about, like, the first Iron Man, for instance. Everything was so tight, so narratively tight, you know, and made sense. Yeah, and I, I think that this movie could have used at least acknowledging that there was ambiguity instead of just, like, it, it felt like the director or the, whoever edited it, it had final edit just didn't really care about yeah what 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 is actually happening here um yeah so yeah. i think i'm i think i'm a little bit more forgiving than you because like i said i still enjoyed it and maybe maybe that's partly because i've seen it more over the last 30 years than you um so i've kind of grown up with it a bit more but um you know i've, I've kind of allowed i've allowed it to change with me maybe a bit more um but yeah i can definitely see flaws though i can definitely see it feels curiously unfinished and quite clunky and um and i still don't really understand whether fred's like you know what he can do and what he can't do um and like we were saying i think the ending's kind of rushed i think it's kind of sweet but it is very rushed yeah it's suddenly like you know like fred's kind of basically dying and he's like don't take the last pill and then i guess she decides not to and collapses and then suddenly they're in this like dream world like you know <laughs> waiting for Freddy to turn up right yeah um, and you know i guess that's her subconscious or fred's where fred lives and he's like face your fears face your fears and then she comes back and he's gone you know um and they have a kiss which is kind of curious because you'd have thought you know because he's i mean that's that's one of the jokes of the film she's grown up and he hasn't so he's like you know Ugh! Like pigeons, you want to do it like a pigeon, you know, because he doesn't understand sex or anything. So it seems strange that it finishes with a kiss to get rid of him. Um, but I did like the ending, you know, I did like the ending. I liked lots of bits, you know. Well, I, the, the I think the it's, it's the stuff. odd movie that, to me, felt like the first 30 minutes were a tragic mess. Right. And then it gradually gets better as it goes along. And usually it's the opposite. Usually it's like someone has a strong idea, does a lot of setup, and then everything kind of falls apart as the movie goes along. Um, I, I agree with you, because I think if you can get past the dog poop, which is kind of hard, <laughs> <laughs> then, yeah, it does get better. Yeah. I mean, as much as I kind of complained about, I don't know who Fred is. I don't, you know, but it 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 starts pulling together what those threads are of what the point of all of this is. Yeah, yeah. Um, she needs to she needs to kind of like believe in herself and also face her fears and just say, well, you know, take control of her life. I guess you know. Yeah, you know, she's been she's kind of forgotten who she was when she was younger, which you know, to be honest, all of us I think are a little bit like that. Um, you know, I think we can all think back to like, you know, when we were teenagers or, or even younger. And I mean, I don't want to say didn't give a shit, but just really just went for it. And I'm probably kind of like achieved whether, whether it was a sport or something. And you're like, I kind of need to, I need to kind of like still have that fire. Like you were saying about the podcast, actually. I still need to have that fire, really. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I'm still a fan. I'll probably dig it out again in a couple of years, two or three years, and watch it again. Um, Rick Mel sadly, died very young. Um, I think about 10 years ago now, maybe. That sounds right. Um, Phoebe Cates, I guess we don't really see her much anymore. 
Um, she she was kind of still popped up in some films in the nineties, didn't she? I remember her being in uh, what's that one about the princess they found? Princess, um, oh, Princess Caribou. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but she pretty much just married Kevin Klein, and that seemed to be enough. Um, I think she yeah. has some boutiques in Manhattan. I think she's much more a nine to five kind of person these days. Yeah, and I'm sure you know she probably found it hard to find decent parts. You know, because I'm sure people just like wanted to trade on her looks and not really, you know, maybe give her the credit as an actress. Um, although I think she's great in this. Like I said, I think she's a great physical comedian in this. Um, uh, so there was talk of uh, so anyway, this came out. It was made for six point seven million, made fourteen point eight million, uh, which isn't great, obviously. Um, there was still talk of a sequel though, and I'm not sure if they offered it. And he said no, but apparently Rick Mel was in contention, obviously. <laughs> um, but then so was uh, I guess as the years rolled past, Jim Carrey, which you can kind of see because the mask is kind of similar. Um, and then later on, Russell Brand, which sounds horrible. Um, oh. Yeah, but of course, you know, we never had a sequel, which is probably a good thing. Probably a good thing. I think it, it's got a nice little ending. It'd be a shame to start it all up again. I mean, what is it? Is it going to be like Phoebe Cates getting abused in a retirement home? And uh, <laughs> Rick Mail comes back, a CGI Rick Mail comes back. <laughs> I, I do think that if you cleaned up the story, you could you could make this again. You could do a remake. I don't know if there's any... Oh, easily. For it, yeah. But- I do I do think that there's there's enough of a core there in the last, you know, like kind of few When you say clean up the story though, do you mean like narratively or do you mean make it more kid friendly? Uh those two things may dovetail, but um I don't think it needs to be more kid friendly, but I think it needs to decide if the audience who the audience is and yeah. that and all ages is perfectly acceptable. Um, for yeah. an answer to that, but they they do need to kind of figure it out because I I could not tell you watching it as clearly as a forty something I was like mm, this isn't really aimed at me. I liked it when I was sixteen. I don't know how I would have felt about it at age eight. I think I would have found Fred a lot. Um, yeah, I'd seen. I mean, I mean, definitely. I think Rick Mel, you know, was too much for a lot of American audiences. And I know the critics absolutely hated this, but not so much him, mm-hmm. but more just the concept. They were like, what's funny about picking your nose? And what's funny about farting? Um, well, everything, if you're 10 yeah. or, even, or even 15, that's still pretty great. Um, which, you know, you could say, isn't that different from the young ones, really? Because um, I feel like the young ones is the same. I feel like the young ones was very punk and totally blew apart the idea of a sitcom, you know, like, you know, the living room and the kitchen and a married couple and arguing with the, the neighbours next door. I mean, the young ones just, like, took a hammer to that and totally smashed it up, which is why everybody loved it, because it was so punk and so new and so crazy. But I think, again, that's dated pretty badly, a lot of it. Yeah. Uh, I tried to watch the young ones again about 10 years ago and was like, I am too old for this now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like, it's kind of like, you know, we'd rather listen to, I don't know, like a chill band than the sex pistols in your car. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, and that doesn't mean, you know, that doesn't mean you've lost your, your vitality. It's just taste, taste change, you know? Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah. But like, you know, I think, yeah, I still give this a thumbs up. I say if you haven't seen Drop Dead Fred for a while, um, definitely give it a revisit. Um, very, I think it is very polarizing, but I think you probably should. You'll realize in the first five ten minutes whether you like it or not. Yeah, I yes, I think very. The minute get through the first five minutes of, with Fred at least, and um, you'll you'll know. So a, a quick side note of, of maybe interest to Americans more than folks in the UK. There's a hot blonde who shows up in the first minute of the movie she's only in it at the car dealership and then you don't see her that is the daughter of former presidential candidate walter mondale oh wow yeah wow (laughs) who has a 
really interesting Wikipedia entry. Uh, I did not know anything about her, but I was watching the credits and the name Eleanor Mondale went by and I was like, this is shot in Minnesota and that's where he was from. And that's that, that, that cannot be a coincidence. And she had a broadcast career and tried to be in some movies and stuff. She's, she's also passed very young. Um, that's but, shame. Yeah. She had lung cancer, I believe. Um, she, she also- uh, I want to go on, sorry. I was just going to also ask you about Bridget Fonda, actually. Yeah, and Bridget Fonda was not yet on the map. This is kind of... Well, this is uh, funny, because, like, I totally missed that that was Bridget Fonda, but but something was kind of, like, tugging at me, going, I kind of think I know that person. Um, Because, yeah, because, I mean, Bridget Fonda something kind of blew up for a couple of years with The Assassin, was it? And um, Mm -hmm. she did something else. Oh, yeah, was it Single White Female? um but then around this time she was doing like weird little cameos and like was it evil dead two or three yeah she wasn't oh she's at the very end of army of darkness yeah 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 she just turns up in the shop that's <laughs> like ash's girlfriend or something and yeah. you're like why, why is she even in it except she get probably knows those guys yeah, I don't. I have no idea what the story was with Bridget Fonda, other than she she was very talented. If you've never seen a simple plan, it's probably for me top ten neo noir. You know, uh, I just watched that again because I'd totally forgotten that until you just said it. Yeah, it's 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 a good one. Um, she's the kind of Lady Macbeth in that, isn't she? Oh, she's so good. She's so freaking good. Yeah, she, she's yeah. the one that like basically no, we could do it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, she she basically just like after that was like, all right, I'm checking out. Like I've I've I made a really good movie, and then now she she just lives in L.A. and is Bridget Fonda, but she hasn't acted in like 20 years or something. That's such a shame. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I mean, I don't know if the Fonda family just has a bunch of money, or she married. You know, I'm somebody. sure they got a ton of money. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah she- She's probably just like, you know, like you said about Phoebe Cates, there's 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 nicer ways to spend my days, probably. Yeah, like who needs it if you don't <laughs> if you're if you're if you, if you, you who wants to spend, you know, 14 hour work days if you don't have to. So uh probably a pretty eight eight of which are just hanging around waiting. So that's that. Right. Um she had the taste of the the celebrity life and and kind of walked away from it. So uh, but yeah, it was, it was, I, it was the nose. She turned profile and I was like, Oh, that's Bridget Fonda's perfect little nose. So. Yeah. <laughs> so pert. It's so, it's so snubbed. Yeah. Snubbing. <laughs> <laughs> and they needed, they needed to do something really specific because you've cast her against Phoebe Cates for somebody, somebody was going to cheat on. And you're just like, yeah, you're going to have somebody pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> um, but anyway, yeah, it's uh, it, it, I I I will. I don't know if I'll ever watch this again. We'll see. But um, yeah, it was it was interesting at least to kind of come back to it and and uh, see how I felt about it all these years later, which is never never a bad thing. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's about it. I think. Um, I guess we'll. Uh, I guess we'll leave it there. Yeah, uh, we are probably. I'm going to release this, and then we're going to uh, we're going to basically start working on Halloween. I think people. So if you see a gap, uh, that's what Simon and I are up to. Uh, yeah. We want to make sure we're ready for you guys uh, for for the spooky season. That's some and, good ideas. Good ideas. Um, I, I think we're, I think y'all will enjoy it. So um, you know, this won't be the only thing I'll probably drop in September. Uh, but uh, I, in fact, I know what I'm doing probably next weekend with Simon. I'm sorry, not with Simon, with Stuart. And um, we'll, anyway, but we will be back doing uh, stuff in October, if not before. Yeah, and it's a nice segue, because this is like, a, like I say, I think this has slight horror elements. You could you could easily recut this, you know, those those trailers they do on YouTube. Oh. Like imagine, imagine The Shining as like a, a heartwarming comedy, you know. You could definitely cut this as a horror film very easily. Oh, very easily. Yes. Like they did with, uh, I think they did that with Mrs. Doubtfire, and it really worked. <laughs> I mean, I can just see the thing of her like laying in bed and them cutting to the jack in the box going, dun, 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 dun. yeah. And his hand yeah. coming around the pillow. Yeah. 
<laughs> Brilliant. All right, everybody. Uh, we'll we'll see you soon again. Cheers. Bye. That about wraps it up for this edition of The Signal Watch, a production of the League of Melbotus. Thanks for sticking with us. If you enjoyed the podcast, we invite you to drop on by The Signal Watch blog, where you'll find write-ups of a wide variety of movies and more. We'd love to hear from you, so find us online and let us know what you think. Whether you prefer email, blog comments, or social media, we'll be happy to hear from you. We'll be back soon with more exceedingly high-quality content. So, until next time. God damn it, babies. You've got to be kind. <laughs>